Good morning, good afternoon. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Wong and thank you for joining today's live stream event. Today, we're really excited to walk you through the new features and functions released with Vault 1.10. This includes the ability to use hardware security modules to the PKI engine, exciting changes to MFA, improvements around database plugin multiplexing, along with many other improvements across the project. Joining me today is Justin Weisig, Senior Product Marketing Manager. During our session, we'll jump into our latest product features and then follow that up with Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, usually within two to three business days. And then lastly, please type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll answer them, doing, we'll answer them during our Q&A section at the end. With that, I'll turn it over to Justin. Great, thanks, Kaylee, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, before we kick things off, I'm just going to post two links into the chat. Uh, also, if you're watching this in the future and you're watching on YouTube, you can look down in the description below, and you'll uh, have them. So these links are to the, to the release blog, which has all the details about everything I'm going to talk about today as well as um, the learn guides. These can be helpful resources if you uh, need to reference this stuff in the future. All right, so today we're gonna be um, going through, uh, so today I'm gonna be going through and doing a talk about a vault, and then I'll get it into some of the new features that um, we launched with vault 1.10. But for folks that are maybe a little bit new to HashiCorp or new to vault, I wanted to give a little bit of background. So maybe starting with the company, for folks that are not familiar with HashiCorp, our focus is really on cloud infrastructure automation. I think oftentimes folks uh, know more about our tools than they do, than maybe they recognize our company name. So we have six major products or six major open source projects that we're focused on. These are things like Vagrant, Packer, Terraform, Vault, Console, Boundary, and Nomad. We're a public company. Um, we've We've been around a little over 10 years. And I think the last time I checked, we had about 1,650 employees. So shifting gears a little, I wanted to talk about, you know, we have a lot of different products, but I wanted to talk about and spend our time with uh, Vault. What's interesting is that as we're going through this transition to sort of orient cloud infrastructure, there's a major shift happening in how we think about security in general, sort of the core principles or approaches you know, philosophies are changing. So in that context, this is where Vault plays at least three major use cases or sort of plays three major roles in that transition. The first is around secrets management, which is how you actually store secrets. You know, how do you distribute them throughout your infrastructure? How do you rotate them? How do you just manage the general life cycle of these secrets? The second is around data encryption or data protection. This is the idea of, you know, how do we create some type of middleware facility for your developers to help them protect their applications? This is almost one level removed from, say, secrets management. These are APIs that you'll give to your internal, you know, developers and say, great, if you need to protect this type of data, you can use these types of APIs that Vault provides. Finally, we have an advanced data protection module. And that really looks at this idea of how do we extend this idea of data protection into other applications? How do we plug into the systems that you already have? Things like storage arrays for um, you know, data at rest encryption, or maybe how do we connect to a database for tokenization of PII data? This is sort of a critical step in protecting data that you have sitting around within your infrastructure. So when we talk about Vault, it is a very widely used tool. You know, um, it's been around since 2014, and it's used by some of the biggest companies in the Fortune 2000. So I wanted to get back to that first use case that we just chatted about around, you know, vault use case of secret management. When we talk about secrets, there's often this question of, you know, what, what are we talking about and what is actually under management here? So the language I like to use is, you know, sort of distinguish between a secret and sensitive data. A secret's a thing like 
A secret is something that you'd use to authenticate or authorize into another system. Sort of a classic example of this is, you know, a username or password. You know, these are API keys um, or TLS certificates. These are often, you know, hypersensitive credentials because they allow you to access to other systems that potentially expose you to a bunch of uh, data. Then when we talk about sensitive data, you know, these are things that you obviously want to keep confidential, you know, or, or you know, they're highly private PII data, things like social security numbers, credit card numbers, et cetera. But why do I make the distinction here? Uh, you know, what's the difference between these two things? Well, there's probably different levels of exposure, you know, on secrets. These are typically things that allow you access into other systems. Say, for example, a database, you know, if that credential is compromised, that potentially exposes that entire database to, you know, being dumped. Whereas, you know, if a, a piece of sensitive data gets exposed, um, you know, the blast radius is a little bit smaller. You know, there's sort of another distinction here, um, especially when you're operating, uh, you know, if you're a large company, you know, some of our larger customers, they might have 100,000 secrets under management. You know, however, you know, sensitive data is a little bit different. They might have billions or trillions of rows of sensitive data, you know, uh, spread all throughout their infrastructure in various, um, you know, databases or, you know, analytics pipelines. So when we talk about secrets management, there's sort of a set of questions, you know, that sort of guide our thinking. These are questions that, you know, obviously you want to have good answers to, and they sort of fall follow from sort of easy, a little bit more comps. So for starters, you know, how do our applications get secrets? You know, say for example, you're a web application and it needs to talk to a database. How does that application get that credential to chat with the database? How do humans get access? You know, you're a DBA and you need to go to the database and debug something in there. How do you get the credential to actually do that? Then we think about things in a slightly more complex way. You know, how do these secrets get updated? Say for example, a credential has been compromised. Now you need to go into all those various applications and update that credential. What if you need to revoke a secret? You know, that secret's obviously been compromised. You know, how do we revoke it as well as doing some auditing to figure out what happened there? You know, so, there are questions that we'd really like to have good answers to. So it's within that context that I sort of want to explain Vault and you know three guiding principles that we have when we think about solving uh, problems. The first guiding principle here is around identity brokering. So on the one side, we have you know systems that provide identity. You know these might be linked accounts like um, you know your GitHub account or an LDAP directory, or maybe you're just logging with a username and password, you know, if you're a human operator, uh, you know, a human operator. These credentials map to, you know, identi an identity within Vault. So you might say, hey, this is Justin. He's a member of the marketing group. Similarly, when you have these applications connecting to Vault, they also have an identity. So, you know, you might have a, a you know, earlier we talked about a web application, that web application might be sitting on an EC2 VM. And, it, and when it connects to Vault, it can use a particular IAM role that defines who that instance is. Or maybe you're using Kubernetes and you can have an application that um, you know, identifies itself through a service account. So in this sense, you know, we get these different identities that connect to Vault and they can be threaded through from your underlying applications. This is sort of a, a fundamental, um, you know, guiding principle of Vault in that, um, you know, we can identify applications based on a variety of different, you know, identity providers. And then we can connect, once they connect to Vault, we can, you know, um, associate those identities with various policies that say, hey, this specific account or this specific identity is allowed access to these specific credentials. You know, maybe, um, you know, we gave that example of a web application. It connects to Vault through an EC2 IAM. And, you know, we have an associated policy that says, hey, this particular identity is able to access these database credentials. So um, it's a very 
uh, you know, cool system in that, you know, we have a host of different identity providers, so we can just plug in with your in existing infrastructure and you can share those identities across, uh, you know, different uh, providers. The second guiding principle here of what Vault does on the other side is that once you have that common notion of identity, you know, Vault has a variety of different integrations for different platforms or different end systems, you know, whether that be databases, you know, cloud providers, you know, message queues, um, uh, you know, if you have an LDAP directory or something like that, there's this common workflow where we can, you know, connect into the various systems that you have and do automated things. Say, for example, you want to generate, um, you know, on the fly AWS credentials, you can use Vault to, to do that stuff. Or maybe you want to, uh, you have a database and you're required by some sort of regulatory requirement to, you know, rotate those credentials on a monthly basis. Vault has those capabilities. So there's a, a, a whole bunch of different, um, you know, integrations once you have that identity set up that you can connect into your existing infrastructure. Finally, how do we, how do you actually interact with Vault? There's sort of three common ways, you know, we have a command line interface, there's a web interface, but by far the most common is through, you know, the API. The workflow here is that, you know, say for example, you're authenticating a Kubernetes application based on a service account. You want to fetch a database credential um, and you're doing this all over the Vault API. The Kubernetes example here is a little bit more, you know, maybe nuanced and that there's a variety of different ways you can actually connect from uh, Kubernetes. You know, um, Vault has the capability of actually injecting secrets right into Kubernetes pods, but you sort of get the idea. You know, Vault is primarily meant for, you know, machines needing secrets, you know, machines talking to other machines and they need those secrets. So they're primarily doing this in an automated fashion and they'll use the API. So we started to chat about, you know, about what Vault is and what you can use it for. I briefly wanted to touch on how you can actually run it. You know, first of all, Vault is an open source project. You can just go to the website and download it. Um, you know, the open source version is, you know, very complete. Uh, people are running it at massive scale. Um, you know, the, then we have a different flavor that's uh, enterprise. Um, so I should say uh, open source is self-managed. So, you know, you'll download the binary, you'll run it, you know, within your cloud environment or within your own data centers. Then we have an enterprise version. This is also self-managed. You know, you'll download it, run it. Um, the difference between open source and enterprise is that in the enterprise version, we have, you know, sort of advanced features. Say, for example, you know, you wanted to do disaster recovery or high availability or you know, performance replication of, you know, data, if you have a, you know, very high request rate or something like that. Also, you get support, um, you know, there's advanced features like, um, you know, HSM support, which we'll chat about later, if you have a hardware security module, and you, you know, need to store credentials within that hardware security module and, and chat with them from Vault. Um, so those Two there are, you know, on-prem. And then the third option is we have a managed service called HCP Vault. So you can go to cloud.hashicorp.com. You can sign up and click a couple buttons and you'll actually get a managed instance of Vault. This is where HashiCorp looks after it for you. So it's very much a traditional managed service. You know, you don't have to have operations teams, you know, monitoring it 24 seven. We're actually doing it for you. So you're just a consumer of it, which is fantastic. So that's sort of my quick overview for folks that, you know, maybe don't have much background on HashiCorp or Vault. Now I sort of wanted to transition into the announcement for what happened with Vault uh, 1.10. So we, for we focused on sort of three core areas. One is ecosystem, um, you know, integrations with making, you know, Vault talk to things better, I guess, if I could just put it very simply, you know, um, as I mentioned before, Vault has a, a ton of different integrations that allow you to chat with different systems. So in this release, you, you'll see things like, hey, we updated the Terraform provider. Hey, we 
updated the you know AWS Lambda extension if you're if you're using that workflow. So there's a variety of different integrations that get updated uh, with each release. There's also a, a lot of um, you know improvements that go into bug fixing and you know sanding off the rough spots of um, you know just general day to day use how to how to improve the product and you know how to make it easier to use. We also made an uh, some really cool enhancements, you know, around how you can protect data, as well as how you can, you know, ensure um, you're actually connecting, you know, with the correct identity. So an example here would be that, you know, we added MFA support to open source. I'll, I'll chat about that in detail in a second. So some of the, the major things that sort of, maybe I'll back up for a sec. I'm just going to sort of break this into two parts. One is Vault ecosystem. Uh, I'm just going to call that, you know, Vault open source. And then, so these are features that are in open source. And then I have a section where it talks about, you know, Vault 1.10 enterprise, and these are enterprise features, just so that, um, you know, we have a sort of a clear line of what goes where. So in the open source, we're very excited to have added, um, you know, login MFA. This adds the capability to add a MFA integration, you know, when you're doing the login process um, to Vault. So this is very much the traditional thing that you think it is, you know, hey, I'm, hey, I'm want to log into Vault, but, you know, this is a highly privileged credential. I want to ensure that this user is actually who they say they are. So we have integrations, um, you know, where you can get a, a time-based one-time password. We have integrations with Octo. Duo and ping ID. So the workflow is generally, hey, I want to log in. Um, you know, I'm going to get a challenge, you know, maybe uh, on my phone through an app. I enter that into Vault and then, uh, you know, it's verified and you're allowed access. So that's awesome. Um, we also added support uh, for Vault to act as an OICD provider, uh, sorry, OIDC provider. That actually went into 1.9, and that was uh, in technical preview, and then we released it, uh, you know, in GA in this release. As I sort of mentioned before, Vault has a variety of different, um, you know, integrations where you can actually connect into, you know, various systems that you maybe already have in your infrastructure. So a, a core use case for this is something called database credential rotation. So, um, you know, maybe you're required. Maybe you're a, a good example would be you're a bank. You're required, you know, by some sort of regulation that, uh, you know, you rotate database credentials, you know, every 30 days. So Vault can be set up to connect into these various systems on those accounts and actually rotate the credentials for you. This is obviously a little bit complex because, hey, um, you know, those applications that are connecting to that database, they also need to get that credential. So, you know, they can call that credential from Vault and you know, you can seamlessly rotate credentials and have your applications updated at the same time. So having said that, um, we added the capability for um, IBM DB2 to uh, take advantage of this same functionality. I'll, I'll go into detail in a sec about that. We added an improvement to Vault around database multiplexing. This is sort of under the covers, uh, you know, when Vault was actually making a connection to a database, it was making one connection per process. So, you know, at the, you know, Linux, um, you know, process level, it was actually connecting out one per process. So say, for example, if you're managing, um, you know, 500 accounts, that's 500 processes. So that's, you know, consumes a lot of memory, um, you know, and it just uh, could use some improvement. So the major thing that we did here is that, um, you know, we bundled all that up within one process. So this greatly saves on, you know, memory consumption, especially if you have uh, uh, a lot of database connections. And we rolled that out for uh, Oracle, uh, Oracle databases. One thing I'll sort of mention is that uh, a lot of the feature improvements actually come to us through, you know, existing customers. So I think that, um, use case was that uh, you know we had a, a user that had a you know tons of oracle databases and they were rotating credentials and they were saying hey you know uh, it would be great if you could uh, you know make an improvement here so um, you know if you are an existing customer and there's uh, something that's annoying you or bothering you definitely reach out and and uh, we'll try to get that fixed 
Um, so we added temp telemetry to Vault Agent. You know, uh, if you're running Vault Agent, obviously you want to instrument and get metrics coming out of it. I, I sort of mentioned earlier about you know um, improving integrations. We added cache support to the Lambda extension. I have slides on all these things where I can go into a little bit more detail, but uh, I just wanted to give you a high level overview. So one of the probably made one of the major features that went out in Vault 1.10 was adding you know, the capability of login MFA to open source. We had this in enterprise for a long time, um, but we wanted to bring the you know, sort of enhanced security um, down to the open source level. You know, we strongly believe that MFA offers, you know, additional protection, especially when you're, you know, uh, accessing credentials. And, you know, we think it offers or provides, you know, stronger protection for accounts, you know, in the event that, a, you know, a credential is compromised. So we wanted to, you know, bring that support from enterprise over to open source. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we're supporting uh, four integrations initially. You know, the one-time password, Okta, Duo, and Ping Identity, or Ping ID. Um, so there's multiple different workflows here, depending on, um, you know, the provider that you choose. We also have detailed, you know, documentation, and there's a learn guide that uh, walks you through it step-by-step. Step. Uh, in the demo section, uh, you know, a little bit later, I'll, I'll actually walk you through that. Also, within this release, um, you know, Vault, OIDC, you know, the identity provider piece uh, was rolled out into GA with Vault 1.10. You know, OpenID is obviously an open standard that provides that identity layer on top of OAuth to ver verify users, you know, against an uh, authorization server. So the workflow, you know, we, we probably interact with it all day is that, uh, hey, you know, I, I need access to some system. You know, a little uh, window appears that says, hey, I'm going to authenticate you against uh, external identity provider. Um, and then, you know, you, you verify yourself and then you're redirected into your application. So Vault can actually, uh, you know, act as that identity provider today. So I sort of <clears throat> mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, database credential rotation. Um, again, this uh, comes through as a, you know, a customer request is that, um, you know, a customer uh, has a lot of IBM DB2 databases. And, uh, you know, traditionally how our, you know, database credential rotation system works is that we'll have a specific plugin that actually connects to the database, um, you know, through the SQL, um, you know, interface, it logs in as, as a normal user, and then it'll generate, you know, SQL commands to, you know, actually rotate those credentials. However, you know, IBM DB2 is a little bit different in that the user authentication is actually done by the operating system. So we have we didn't actually make a change here. We've sort of published a pattern for, hey, if you want to, um, you know, rotate static credentials or generate dynamic on the fly credentials, you can use this pattern. And the way it works is that, um, you know, we're going to use Vault's LDAP uh, capability along with, um, you know, an IBM plugin that basically allows Vault to connect to the LDAP directory and generate those credentials for you. And then, you know, IBM DB2 will fetch those credentials from LDAP. So um, uh, I'm very, obviously very happy to like publish, publish this uh, capability and, you know, thanks to the education team for uh, putting that together. I sort of mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we added telemetry support for Vault agent. Maybe I'll just back up a second. So. You know, Vault um, has a capability to run in, uh, you know, a highly available cluster, you know, just as the open source version. So, you know, you'll have, you might have three, a three node instance uh, you, that's acting as a highly available cluster. And if, you know, one of those nodes goes down, you know, Vault will detect it and automatically recover from it and all that stuff. So, you know, obviously you want to instrument that and log it and monitor it and, you know, make sure it's healthy all the time and things like that. Right. And so um, that's for the vault server. Then we have this capability called the vault agent, which um, is sort of a minimal vault uh, binary, or I guess it's the real vault binary, but it's, you know, it has minimal capabilities that you can, you know, use to do additional things. 
and we've added telemetry to that um, so that you can also sort of instrument, you know, hey, is auth successful or is it failing or hey, you know, what are my cache counters or proxy counters or things like that. So um, we have the documentation and learn guides. I don't know, I don't think I mentioned it at the top of the webinar, but, um, you know, I'll, we'll publish these slides and all the links so you have access to everything here. So, you know, um, uh, you can actually click these links if you, uh, when you watch the recording. The next capability that we uh, rolled out was um, in terms of the, you know, AWS Lambda extension. You know, this is an integration with AWS where, you know, if you're using a Lambda function and, hey, maybe you need to uh, fetch out to call an additional credential for some piece of infrastructure in your, um, you know, your cloud environment or something like that. Or maybe you're using, you know, advanced capabilities in Vault to do things like tokenization or, you know, data encryption or something like that. Obviously, you need to connect the Vault to, um, uh, you know, to process the request. However, if you're in, you know, a, a really high scale environment, uh, you might want to cache some of those credentials. So you don't want to do a round trip to Vault every single time that you may need that credential. So um, the Lambda extension has been, uh, you know, sort of extended to add this cache capability, um, which is obviously really good if you're, you know, processing tens of thousands of requests per second or something. So at this point, I wanted to transition over to, um, you know, sort of the enterprise uh, features. The first one here is, um, you know, we've extended support for moving secrets engines and auth methods. The reality here is that this also is supported in, you know, open source. But the reason I'm talking about it in the enterprise section is that um, we also added the capability to, you know, move from one space to another. Um, namespaces are a little bit um, uh, nuanced in that they're an enterprise feature. But the the way to think about namespaces, if you don't know anything about them, I'll just give you a quick, uh, you know, thirty second intro is uh, a namespace is the ability to sort of carve off a, a section of vault um, via, you know, a path that basically allows you to say, you know, uh, for this part of the organization, I want them to live in this namespace. So that might be your, um, you know, uh, you know, Canadian arm of the company. And then in another space, maybe you have the, uh, um, you know, uh, United States section. And then in another namespace, maybe you have your European contingent. So, why this is important is that, um, you know, say for a GDR, um, you know, if you have some sort of compliance thing of, um, you know, GDPR or something like that, where, hey, I don't want these specific secrets to, um, you know, maybe be replicated or folks in a different organization to have access to this data, it's namespaces are a way to basically carve this up. So um, we've added the capability or extended the capability of sort of moving uh, mounts and secrets engines between uh, these various namespaces. Um, however, if you're using the open source version, you know, that typically means, hey, I'm going to move it between a different path or something like that. Um, we've also updated the way uh, tokens work. So this is essentially, you know, we've updated the format. Uh, I'll chat about this one in detail because I, I want to show you a couple of diagrams. Um, the next one here is um, we added, um, you know, HSM support for the PKI secrets engine. So uh, HSM is basically a hardware security module. You can think of this like a, a box that maybe sits in your data center, or maybe it's a, you know, a cloud provider HSM. Um, so PKI infrastructure is basically, hey, I, I need to generate a certificate, a TLS certificate. Um, you know, maybe you're doing some sort of authorization or authentication within your environment and you need to verify identity between two things, or maybe you want to do some data encryption type stuff, you can use the PKI engine to, you know, generate tons of certificates through the API, which is, you know, obviously fantastic from doing it through a manual workflow. However, <clears throat> however um, you know, there are certain types of customers that, you know, they really want to uh, ensure the security of those certificates. And so we've added the capability of, you know, uh, generating and signing them uh, via HSM. I'll, <clears throat> I have a few diagrams on it, so I'll help explain that too. 
finally, we've made some you know, interface improvements around the transform secret engine. So the transform secret engine allows you to do things like um, format preserving encryption, FPE, which, um, you know, say, for example, hey, I have a social security number or, you know, I have a passport number or something like that. You know, all that information is sitting in, um, you know, a database somewhere. Hey, I, I want to encrypt that data, um, you know, format, uh, you know, transform FPE allows you to do that. Uh, transform also does things like tokenization. Hey, I want to generate a token. You know, why transform is sort of interesting or what you'd use it for is, you know, uh, say you have a, a big analytics pipeline and you have a lot of customer data sitting in there. It's generally, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just going to have a drink of water here. You know, that database, uh, that data sitting in a database generally isn't protected. You know, um, you know, if you have a data analyst in there, you know, and they, you know, select those certain fields, they might be able to view it. Why transform is important is, you know, you can actually go into that database and encrypt those values. So they look like real values, but um, they're actually encrypted. So, you know, that's what format preserving encryption is. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, a pretty cool technology. So we've updated the uh, user interface to just sort of have those capabilities. So I'll maybe walk through this in a little bit more detail. So, um, you know, around moving secrets engines and auth methods, here's basically what the commands look like. You know, hey, I want to move a secrets engine. I'm going to move it from one path to another. Um, same thing with an auth mount. Hey, I want to move this auth from uh, one area to another. You know, in open source, why would you do this? It's generally probably around, you know, to do with your organization. Hey. You know, this one group is doing this certain thing and, you know, maybe they called, you know, they named it as a certain uh, you know, at a path and maybe that's changed. You know, in enterprise, it might be, um, you know, hey, the Canadian folks are doing this thing and, you know, maybe it's transitioning over to the US folks or something. But the, the general capability here is, you know, hey, I want to move one thing to another place. And it, uh, this just gives you a, a very easy way to do it. So I sort of mentioned server-side uh, consistent tokens earlier. Um, so uh, at the very top of the talk here, we sort of talked about identity. Um, generally when um, you know, machines are talking to other machines, well, I you know, verify them through some sort of identity. You know, if it's coming through AWS IAM, you know, we'll do it through there or they're coming through a server, uh, Kubernetes service account, we'll do it that way. Another way that this happens is through tokens. So you can generate a token um, and it gives you the ability to connect into Vault. You know, tokens are sort of a core method for authentication and, you know, validating, you know, when a, a Vault client connects. You know, therefore, you know, pretty much all requests that uh, come into Vault, you know, need to be authenticated with a token. So, um, you know, when you're... Um, when you're using these, you know, highly available clusters or, you know, performance, uh, you know, replicas, um, some clients, you know, could request, maybe I'll back up a second. So, you know, I talked earlier about, you know, how you could have a, you know, a, a multi-node cluster, right? Within that cluster, there's typically, um, you know, a, a leader of that cluster. Um, so when you're, requesting things from that cluster, you can actually send requests to, you know, any of the nodes within that cluster and Vault will, you know, happily uh, figure out, hey, the leader of this cluster is this certain node and it will route the request there. You know, earlier to Vault 1.9 and sort of the earlier versions, client requests could sometimes get routed to a performance standby node that didn't have the, you know, replicated data yet, um, you know, and it would result in an error. We did roll out some fixes for this, but it required, um, you know, custom HTTP headers, um, you know, on the client to actually, you know, implement that. But we wanted, uh, you know, a better fix. So in Vault 1.10, we changed the token format to enable sort of a, a simpler and more reliable client experience when you're using performance standby nodes. So we actually bake the sort of minimum relevant state right into the token itself. So when um, you know a performance standby node 
receives a request, it can actually decide right on the fly without having to talk to anyone else. Hey, do I need to forward this request to an active node? Um, you know, if maybe they're behind in consuming the RAF log or something like that. So this enables, you know, uh, higher performance since standby nodes can actually handle the requests themselves without, um, you know, having to forward them. So there's sort of two changes. One is obviously we've implemented that implemented that change that we think you know is a much more elegant solution to that problem. Uh, we've also updated the token prefix. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is you know obviously we're talking a lot about um, you know vault and automation. This is more of a heads up. You know if you're doing some sort of uh, scripting or you're looking for these tokens or you're handling in them in some way, we've updated the prefix for these certain types of tokens. So for Service tokens, you know, they used to have the prefix s dot. Now they have this hvs dot. Um, you know, and you can look for batch tokens and recovery tokens and things like that. If you're not doing any of this type of stuff, you know, honestly, you don't need to probably worry about it. But I just wanted to give that heads up. So earlier we talked about, um, you know, PKI gets HSM support. You know, we sort of talked about the problem. You know, there's customers out there that you know they have HSMs and they want to take advantage of them to meet, um, you know, obviously their uh, compliance requirements. So we've added uh, support for the PKI engine to offload, you know, generation and signing of certificates to the HSM. What's cool about this is we're also su supporting, you know, Azure Key Vault as well as AWS KSM. So you know, if you're running you know, in your own data centers and you have, you know, a physical HSM box, you can connect Vault up to it. Or if you're running in a cloud environment, you know, AWS or Azure, you can actually go and connect out to their instances, which is uh, obviously really cool. So that's it for me. Um, I do have a couple of resources. Um, and then obviously I, I wanted to do sort of a demo here. So again, I'm just going to post these uh, resources in the chat. If you're watching this on um, YouTube, definitely go and you know check out the description box, and you'll have the you know blog post and all the learn guides. So I'm just going to um, get out of this for a second. So I thought I'd maybe do something a little bit different, um, um, you know, for the demo today. You know, normally I'll I'll go over to the console and I'll sort of show you um, you know various functionality. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight today is that, um, you know, we have uh, obviously the blog here, you can go through and you can find all the functionality and, um, you know, there's, if you want to learn about login MFA, you can go and click through to the docs, but we also have very detailed hands-on guides and that's, um, you know, sort of the demo or walkthrough that I wanted to show you today. I want to sort of, uh, you know, walk through what the learn site is and then show you some of the capabilities of the learn site so that if um, you you want to um, you know if you're learning vault for the first time it can be an amazing resource sort of a gold mine of content as well as if you're an experienced user with vault and you want to get up to speed on some new capability uh, typically we'll have you know like a deep dive walkthrough where you can go through that so that's what i wanted to um, sort of show you so the learn site is, it's called learn.hashicorp.com slash vault. Actually, um, you know, we have it for all of our various products. So, you know, if you're, uh, you know, using Terraform to, you know, automate your infrastructure, you can go in there and learn about it. Same thing with console or, you know, any of the other products. Obviously, we're talking about vault today, so I'm going to show you that. So um, what the learn site is, is basically hands-on labs. So, um, Maybe I'll start with just um, you know the getting started one, and I'll sort of show you what that looks like, and then we'll move on to some of the more uh, deeper dive things. So, you know, obviously we talked about secrets management. So there's a lab in here that says, hey, you know, how do you actually uh, get your first secret? There's videos in here that sort of explain it, so a three minute video, and then you know it walks you through, hey, what are the concepts of uh, secrets? You know, what are the commands? How do you actually go and you know set up a secret engine? How do you put a secret in into that secret engine? You know, how do you fetch it out? All of this is sort of like, um, you know, step by step, incrementally building up your knowledge, which can be absolutely fantastic if you're um, just learning Vault. You know, obviously this is this first uh, secret. You know, maybe we want to get into dynamic credentials. These are 
you know, credentials that are short lived and you can generate them on the fly, uh, things like that. And then typically with each release, um, you know, we'll have a, a dedicated set of tutorials that were, you know, either released or updated for that release. So, you know, we're talking about Vault 1.10 here, so we'll go into it. So by now you should actually recognize a few of these things. So we have, uh, you know, IB2, uh, IBM DB2 credential rotation. We have MFA, you know, uh, moving secrets between, you know, off mounts and different secret engines, uh, you know, um, fetching metrics with vault agent, you know, tokens, uh, you know, hey, I want to set up an OI, OIDC provider, that always gets me, um, or, you know, hey, maybe I need to do something with Lambda, uh, how, do I, uh, how do I do that? So the one thing I sort of wanted to focus on was MFA. I was thinking about demoing this, and then I sort of transitioned to the idea of actually just showing you, because um, I, th I think, you know, having the capability to actually go through this step by step on your own is probably, you know, a, a lot more useful because you're going to want to set it up, right? So, you know, you can, you can watch me do it, but you can also look at the documentation and see step by step how you can actually do it. So um, there's lots of diagrams in here that sort of show you, uh, you know, what does the request uh, sort of flow look like? And then it goes through the, some of the prerequisites, um, you know, you're going to set up a, a Docker environment shows you how to actually, um, you know, connect to uh, ping identity to set up, um, you know, the MFA integration. And then it shows you how to actually connect back to vault to, um, let me go down here to the section where it actually fetches uh, the token. So, you know, you'll have an application that says, hey, uh, please enter this, uh, you know, particular token into vault. And then uh, you'll be granted uh, access to this particular identity. It's super cool because, um, you know, everyone sort of has a, if you're a vault, if you're interacting with vault on a, a daily basis, obviously you're gonna have a base level of knowledge with vault, but, uh, you know, with hundreds of integrations and, uh, you know, constantly updated capabilities, uh, obviously you're not gonna be an expert on anything. I'm, I'm constantly in, on this website, uh, you know, learning about the new capabilities or, you know, hey, if I need to set up some, um, you know, integration, there's a step-by-step -step guide you know, I'll just pop into the AWS Lambda extension too. Um, you know, say for example, you want to connect into, uh, you actually want to get a proof of concept uh, set up, you know, this will walk you through, hey, you know, you're going to connect into your, uh, you know, AWS environment, you're going to set up uh, Vault, um, you know, here's how to get your, um, you know, Lambda credentials. And then it walks you through actually, you know, enabling, you know, authentication, and uh, it'll walk you through step by step with the commands and explaining what it is. So it's a uh, absolute uh, gold mine. Um, as well as if you want to do, um, you know, a vault certification or something like that, you know, we have step by step guides. All this is free. It's totally, um, you know, open source or whatever. You you can. Um, I think there's. A, let me just uh, scroll down to the bottom. All of this stuff is hosted up on um, GitHub too. I forget where the link is here, but there is a link somewhere that you can, you know, edit it on uh, GitHub if you find a mistake or something like that. So I think that's it for me. If you have a, um, a question, uh, please pop it into the box there and I'd be more than happy to answer, um, you know, any questions about what we've talked about uh, today or just uh, generally, uh, you know, Vault in general. I'll just open up the chat box here. Ah, so the, there's one in here about, um, you know, what HSM vendors do you support? So let's go back to that uh, slide. So it's generally, um, you know, obviously there's the big players here that, um, you know, HSMs, the names that you can recognize. But the reality is, you know, any vendor that supports, you know, the PKCS11 uh, standard is what we support. So, you know, if your HSM supports that, uh, Chances are Vault will just work with it. That's actually the only question that we had right now. I think, uh, you know, thanks Kaylee for like going through and answering all the questions and the discussions there. So if anyone has any more questions, uh, feel free to pop them in. If not, we... there, there's a couple questions in the chat if you want to open that real quick. Sure, one sec. 
sorry, it might take uh, just a second for me to read through here. So uh, I'm just reading it. Uh, there's a question in here about, um, you know, hey, will the recording and slide deck be available? Yep, we're going to email that out within a couple of days. Um, so the recording will also be posted up on YouTube, so you can have that, but you'll get an email with, um, you know, a link to the recording and the slide deck. So you'll have all the links and everything. Uh, typically takes a couple of days. Um, so there's a question in here about, um, you know, Vault HA Raft being open source. Where can you learn more about that? So um, Vault HA Raft is open source. So um, maybe I'll, I'll sort of talk about that a little bit. So, you know, if you're running in Vault, Vault has a capability of just running as a, a single Vault instance. You know, hey, I, I go to vaultproject.io, I download Vault, uh, I fire it up. Uh, you know, that's a single node instance. We have the capability of adding this little slash dev flag, which basically turns off all the security. So if you want to like, you know, go through those tutorials I would show you on the learn site, you know, it's fantastic. It uh, boots up within a couple seconds and then you can just go, go through all the tutorials and away you go. So that's great for learning vault or, you know, a single node instance, but Hey, what happens when, yeah, I've, I've proved this concept out and now I want to put this into production. How do I actually do that? Well, that's not some enterprise feature that's locked away. You can just do that in open source. So typically how folks do that is we have this concept of uh, integrated storage. So, um, you know, obviously you're putting secrets into vault or sensitive data into vault. It needs to be stored somewhere, right? So we have this idea of storage backends and um, vault has a capability of having integrated storage. So basically what this looks like from a sort of an architecture point of view is, I'll have three different nodes or instances or cloud VMs or whatever. You have three distinct operating systems. You're going to install Vault onto each one of those. And then you're going to configure it in a highly available way using you know, Vault uh, you know, uh, integrated storage. Under the hood, this is actually using you know, highly available uh, Raft technology that's you know, from some of our other, other products like console. So what this, what this actually means is you, you know, you're going to set up a leader of that cluster and then you're going to join other vault nodes into that cluster. And then sort of all of those instances are chatting with each other, you know, using the raft protocol and they're saying, Hey, are, are you healthy? Are you serving requests? And you know, the, the, the nodes are all saying, yeah, I'm healthy. Everything's good. And they're constantly doing this sort of chat back and forth to make sure, uh, you know, everything's up and running. If all of a sudden, you know, uh, one of the nodes in the cluster has a failure or it gets goes offline or, you know, whatever happens, um, you know, obviously that communication of saying, hey, everything's healthy is interrupted. And after a period of time, you know, there will be a, um, or a, an election that happens between those uh, nodes that are in the cluster and, you know, it'll elect a new leader. So that's sort of how highly available, uh, high availability works within, you know, Vault open source. It's awesome. Tons of people are using it in production. Uh, it works really good. We have a sort of extended capability on the enterprise side called performance replication. This is where essentially you can have sort of, you know, nodes that act as, uh, you know, sort of like a performance cache. So say, for example, you're running, uh, you know, infrastructure and, in, you know, uh, on the U.S. West Coast and you have, uh, you know, infrastructure on the U.S. East Coast. Hey, I, I want to have my primary clusters on the West Coast but I also need to replicate that data so it's close to my applications that are in the uh, you know, East Coast or something like that. So you can replicate that data over, acts as a cache. Any requests that you know, come over uh, can be forwarded over to the you know, uh, sort of the main cluster, I, I guess, everywhere. So that's sort of, maybe that's a roundabout way of answering your question, but um, yeah, uh, the HA support is in open source and then we've extended that capability into enterprise. Um, I don't have a, so the question here is around, um, you know, PKI HSM support um, and when that will come to uh, GCP. I don't actually have a timeline, but, um, you know, obviously it's on the radar since we're supporting uh, the other clouds. Um, there's a question in here about, um, does the transform secret engine um, require backend storage? Um, so there's sort of a two-part answer to this one. One is, um, you know, if you're using uh, 
um, you know, transform with format preserving encryption. So I sort of gave the example earlier of, you know, I, I have a data analyst and he has a big data lake and, or he or she has a big data lake and they're going in there and, you know, looking at credit card numbers or something, you can encrypt that data using format preserving encryption. You don't need a storage backend for that. You know, uh, Vault is basically, you know, looking at those values, encrypting them and passing them back, or, you know, looking at those values, decrypting them and passing them back. However, uh, Transform also has the additional capability of tokenization. This is where you pass a piece of sensitive data to Vault and it generates, you know, a unique token that uh, can identify that data. So we're not using encryption. This is, you know, not reversible type stuff, right? So um, when you're using Transform with that tokenization capability, we do require a storage backend. This is, you know, obviously like a database. I think there's, you know, Postgres is supported. Uh, I'm sure there's others, but I don't know off the top of my head. But the, the reason why we need backend storage is, you know, we need to perform that lookup. You know, of, hey, someone passes us a token, we need to match that with some sort of PII data, or someone gave us some PII data, we need to generate a token and track that somewhere. That's why the, um, you know, the data storage is required. Um, looks like, thanks for sharing the uh, links there. Actually, um, you know, so there's a question in here about MFA support coming to Vault. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder there, but that uh, will be here uh, shortly. So uh, you'll obviously hear an announcement about it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's definitely on our radar. Uh, there's another question about, um, you know, is Vault Raft in open source? Yep, totally is. I, I think I explained that one probably a little, little too much. Uh, I don't know about uh, Raft or RSA secure ID for MFA support. Uh, I can check internally on that one. Same thing goes with um, uh, FIDO and other keys. I, I, I don't know the roadmap. I'd, I'd have to check with PM on that one. Um, just looking through the other questions here. Uh, there's a question in here about, um, you know, Vault auto-generating SSH keys for GitHub. I don't think we, well, I know we don't have a, you know, a capability for that. So um, we do have some use cases around, um, you know, Vault SSH. So if you, um, you know, just type into Google Vault SSH, you'll come up with a, a page that basically has all our capabilities and you can read through that. But we don't have an integration with GitHub that, you know, populates those keys. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through this. I think that's pretty much it. Um, Kayla, I'll, I'll, I'll pass things back to you, but uh, I just want to say, um, you know, thanks everyone for uh, joining the call and, you know, sitting, uh, you know, submitting questions and hopefully you'll find uh, Vault 1.10 really useful. And uh, thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. And thank you, everyone who submitted all the questions. We had a lot of interaction, so we appreciate that. Um, we hope everyone enjoyed today's live stream and is excited for Vault 1.10. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this is recorded and it will be made available within two to three days and then also posted on the HashiCorp YouTube site. Um, we appreciate you joining and we hope you have a great day. Take care.